Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening. This is John McDougall. I am the event coordinator here at Murder by the Book in Houston. And before we get started with tonight's event, I just wanted to make a couple of quick store announcements. First up, if you guys have not come to visit us for in a while, we are open. We reopened for browsing um, in October. We saw some people calling and asking if they need to make appointments. You don't need to make appointments. You can just pull up and wander in, come in, wander around. Um, we are not limiting the number of people in the store anymore, and we're encouraging masks. So we hope that you will come see us. Uh, we know there are still some people who aren't getting out just yet. So if curbside pickup is more your style, you can definitely just give us a call when you pull into the parking lot. We had a couple of people do that today. So we are always happy to uh, run stuff out to the car for you. Of course, we're always available at murderbooks.com. Uh, one of the most asked questions we've been getting since um, the pandemic started basically was when are we gonna be able to start hosting some authors in store again? And we're happy to report that in September, we will be hosting, uh, starting September 4th, we'll be hosting um, Miranda James, AKA Dean James, who is the store manager at the store for many years. Uh, in the store, we'll also be hosting William Kent Kruger, David Liss and Lisa Jewell throughout September. So as you're looking at the fall event calendar, they will the events will either be listed as a virtual event or in store. Um, so that way you'll know which is which. Most of those that we've set up have been with authors directly, not quite publishers yet. So I'm not sure how much more will actually get added to the calendar for the rest of the year. And as many of you guys know, the events tend to slow down around the holidays anyway, but we're super excited to have a few things on the books. Also wanted to mention they haven't officially made the tour announcement yet, but they will be doing so next Tuesday. We just confirmed that we will be hosting a ticketed Zoom event with Paula Hawkins. You guys might know her from her book, Girl on the Train, which we all love, as well as her second. Uh, she's going to be in conversation with Lee Child, and that is going to happen on August 28th. Tickets are super easy. Just buy a copy of the new book from us. We'll be getting some signed copies. And when you do that, we will be giving you a um, the, the Zoom invite to join. So I think that is all of our kind of general store stuff. As Susan and Mariah are chatting this evening, if you guys have questions uh, for either of them, you can post those in the comments on Facebook or on in the uh, live chat on YouTube, and we will leave some time to get to those. I also wanted to mention that we do have signed copies of Hollywood Spy, so if you have not gotten your copy yet, I'll, I dropped a link uh, in the comments uh, that will take you directly to the page where you can order one of those. Our signed copies are in stock, so if you get it ordered, we will get it shipped out quick. So I'm going to get us started and bring out our authors. I'm going to start with Mariah Fredericks, who was kind enough to jump in. Uh, we were originally going to be chatting with Lori Raider Day uh, tonight with Susan, but something came up and Lori wasn't able to do it. And uh, Mariah has jumped in and we appreciate that. So we are going to bring her out. How are you tonight, Mariah? I'm very well. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this with us. Oh, God, it's my pleasure. So many of you might remember we did an event with Mariah and Jess Montgomery um, a month or so ago, a little bit closer to the releases of their books. So if you guys want to check out that chat, you can always scroll back through our uh, videos on Facebook and YouTube. We've got all those archived. Uh, Mariah's most recent release is Death of a, a Showman. I almost said snowman, death of a showman. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Mariah Fredericks was born and raised in New York City where she still lives with her family. And she is the author of several YA novels and A Death of No Importance is her first adult novel and the first in this series. And now we're gonna bring out Miss Susan Aaliyah McNeil. How are you tonight, hey, Susan? Hey, I'm wonderful, John, how are you? I'm good, it's so good to see you. It's so good to see you too. And hi, Mariah. Hey, Susan. For, for everyone who's asking, so Susan and I have, have said multiple times, next year we will do this in store. So we will, we were actually Absolutely. like, we yes. were lucky last, was, what did we see you in like February of last year? Is that when that most Yeah, recently? right before everything shut down. Yeah, so. It was crazy. Susan was one of the few authors that we actually got to host in 2020, which I'm, I'm glad oh. you made the cut. Um, <laughs> Uh, and as I said, we have signed copies of the newest Maggie Hope, which is The Hollywood Spy. And uh, so Susan Aaliyah McNeil is the New York Times bestselling author of the Maggie Hope Mysteries. She won the Barry Award and has been nominated for the Edgar McCavity, Agatha, Left Coast Crime, Dillis, and ITW Thriller Awards. She lives in Brooklyn, New York with her husband and son. And The Hollywood Spy is her 10th novel, which seems crazy that you are 10 books into this series already. It's it's totally crazy. It seems yeah. nuts. <laughs> I mean, and for a while they were you were doing like two a year for a while, weren't you? When it first got one smoking. a year, one yeah. a year. But you know what? That's because they held the first one, um, uh, so yeah. I kind of could get behind it. So now I'm 
not so, but you know, I try, I do my best. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and so as, so as if you guys are watching, if you're a regular murder by the book and for customers, you guys will know that we are huge fans of Susan's series. Um, Sally and I binge read, I think the first like six of them right before Susan came to visit us for the first time. Um, so we're so excited for this, for the new book and tonight's event. And as I said, if you guys have questions for Susan or Mariah about this book, the previous books, research, writing, any of that stuff, please post those in the comments and we will get to those in a little bit. But for now, I am gonna turn it over to Mariah and let them chat and I will see you guys in just a little bit. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. <laughs> <laughs> so I love this book and I've loved this book since you first told me what the idea for the, the next Maggie Hope was. And I remember thinking, because in the last few books, especially King's Justice, Maggie's been through hell. Mm -hmm. So I felt like this is good. She'll get away from the blitz. She'll get some sun, some glamour. She'll maybe reconnect with her old flame, John Sterling. But she immediately walks into a really difficult situation doesn't she at the outset of the book she does although there is some sun there's like not a lot of rationing they do have some fun they go out dancing it's not a oh, complete yeah. bummer like i do feel like this has given maggie a chance to reset recalibrate kind of get back to her old self but there is mm -hmm. a murder you know mm -hmm. as, as happens in these books so <laughs> i mean it's a a murder with a sort of complicated connection to her personally, right? Right. So she goes out to Los Angeles because her her ex boyfriend's fiance was killed or it has died, and the police have found nothing. But he believes she was murdered, so he knows that Maggie has some experience in this department, and he asks her to come to Hollywood to sort of check things out for him. Right, right. So, as you say, there is it, it is a different scene for her. Forgive me for the ear thing. Um, and there is so much like fun and glamour and Hollywood gossip and fun stuff like that um, in the book. And one of the delights of it is the celebrity cameos. You have you know Walt. Disney wandering through and Hattie McDaniel and Leah Horn and George Balanchine and you brought in Cab Calloway. And I, there's a family connection, right? With Cab there Calloway. There is. There's a, a family connection. Um, Cab Calloway is my husband's uncle by marriage. His aunt, um, Nuffy, married Cab in the late 40s. Wow. Wow. That's so awesome that you got to bring him. In. I, I, had felt, to, I had to. I had you had to. to. <laughs> and with Maggie comes her friend, Sarah, who's a ballet dancer who's filming a movie. And she's also had like a really tough time of things. And it's sort of a reset for her as well. What did Sarah's story allow you to explore? Well, you know, Sarah was going, she was asked by um, Lincoln Kirsten to go work with George Balanchine on this uh, movie, Star Spangled Canteen, which is one mm -hmm. of the many, many canteen, it's my fictionalized version of like the many, many canteen movies that were being done. And so because Sarah's going, that's another impetus for Maggie to go as well, because I don't think she would have just gone like flown across the world to be with her ex-boyfriend, but Sarah was <laughs> She had a place to stay and I don't right. know, it just seemed it seemed like a good a good way to get them both into the sunshine. Right. Right. And Jen Maggie gets to go on set and visit her friend there. And you know, it's a great way to bring in all the, the Hollywood stuff. Were there stories about how like, there are so many great stories of you know the movies mobilized for the war? Was mm -hmm. there stuff that you had to leave out um, for pace that broke your heart to leave out? Or did you get oh, it all in? Sure. I mean, I just sort of brushed over it. But I mean, everything was controlled by 
the government um, like propaganda. So it had to be like, oh. yay, USA, yay, everyone's working together, standing shoulder to shoulder. There's no dissent. There are no issues here. We're all proud Americans who are working towards the war effort. And right. as you see in the book, that's not necessarily true with every single person. Right, right. And, you know, I was thinking as I read the book, you really, you could have gone for just the Hollywood and war story. And you actually made a decision to tell a bigger, more complicated story about America at this time. And I was wondering, like, what was that decision process like for you? How did you decide, like, no, I'm not going to make it just a big studio book? Oh, well, it actually came along with the inspiration for the book. It came when I read um, Stephen Ross's Hitler in Los Angeles, which is a book that huh. um, my husband actually brought back from Los Angeles for me. He was... Um, some people might know he's a performer for the Muppets and the Jim Henson company and Sesame street. And he was performing at the Hollywood bowl. And he brought me back this wonderful book, Hitler in LA, you know, it could have been jewelry, but no, it was Hitler in LA. <laughs> he knows um, you. <laughs> but it's kind of cool in that it inspired this whole book. So Hitler in LA is actually, um, it's a Pulitzer prize nominated book and it details all of the, the Nazi groups that were in Los Angeles and a spy ring um, that was formed to combat those Nazi groups. So I used that as my way in um, to, uh, so Maggie solving the mystery, but there's also a much bigger picture going on with, with those groups. Yeah. I read in your, in the author notes that LA was actually a hub of white supremacy at mm -hmm. this time, which was a total shock to me. And, and obviously it was a shock jump. to me too. I, I always, yeah. cause I think of that as so liberal, but um, <laughs> no, like Anaheim was nicknamed Clanaheim. There's a lot of, wow. there was a lot of KKK out there. Um, there were a lot of fascist groups, the silver shirts, the copperheads, um, the German American Bund, uh, a lot of different groups that were sort of all on their own, but they were all, they were all fascist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And was, were there, what were there? I mean, you sort of allude to tension with like Mexican Americans, even mm -hmm. then is going on. Absolutely. The summer of 1943, when I really started to investigate was, a terrifying time in the United States. Um, there was the Zoot Suit riots in Los Angeles. There were race riots in Detroit. There were riots in Harlem in New York. There were riots in uh, wow. Texas and Georgia. Um, and writing it in, you know, last summer was so surreal. I mean, it was absolutely yes. crazy. It was crazy to be reading about these different riots and, Wow, what a can we just say like what a year like pandemic <laughs> like the Black Lives Matter movement which you know so important and I'm so glad everything happened but it's just uh, wow that was a lot yeah, and then you, to deal with it fictionally too yeah and you couldn't have known I mean you knew that none of these issues had gone away but that they would become so acute as you were writing this book I mean when I was reading it. I was like, Charlottesville, Charlottesville, Charlottesville. I mean, it, it's really inescapable. Absolutely. Um, but, you yeah. know, there's a long, there is a long history, if you trace it, um, you know, from the, well, I mean, from the beginning, but like from the 30s especially. But, you know, we can look at relatively recent events like Ruby Ridge and Waco and um, the attack on the FBI building um, in Oklahoma City and see a lot of how this has all prefigured what we're going through now. Yeah, you were saying that the inspiration for sort of the, the leader of the white supremacist group, Will Whitaker, in the book, that you drew a lot on the Timothy McVeigh 
story and you like you went, grew up in the same neighborhood as Timothy McVeigh? We grew up in the same part of Western New York. Um, wow. Not, not in the same neighborhood or even the same town, but like we were like a close by town. Uh -huh. um, like I would ride my bike around there. So that's how close it was. Um, and we are, you know, well, I mean, obviously he's dead, but we're the same age. So it was always sort of strange to me that like someone was so close to me, both in age and geography and, you know, and took such a different path. Right. Right. What, you know, I can guess, but were there particular things that you took from his story to bring into this story? Like what, what were the flashpoints? Well, I don't want to give away any spoilers, but um, if you if you read the story with the you know, it, uh, with the idea of what terrorism does, which is bring down a huge building to like get a lot of attention, um, right. you know, you'll see the parallels. Right, right. I really liked in the book the way that it, you show that this the clan group is not some sort of shadowy separate thing that operates in darkness, but how they have a presence um, throughout the town and in civic life, in neighborhood life, even in mm -hmm. the police force, which is totally terrifying. What what kind of research did you do to establish that framework? Because it's pretty complex. Was that the Ross book as well, or that was the Ross book? But there are actually, if you start digging, um, there are a lot of documented sources for these things. Um, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't hard to find really if yeah. when you start looking. So yeah, yeah. But there's One, fun stuff, too. <laughs> there is fun stuff, too. Let's get back to the fun stuff. Um, you always visit the places that you're going to um, to write to, where you're going to set the stories. You know, you had to go to Paris, right? Um, I had to go to Paris. You, Hello. I had to go to Paris. And you were actually able to visit LA because I remember all the fabulous pictures. Um, on yeah, Facebook. before things shut down. Yeah. 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 Um, that was, are there, I mean, yeah. what were the highlights? <laughs> like top well, five. I think, um, you know, I got to stay at the Chateau Marmont, which was really kind of interesting. I know it was, it was like, I'm not cool enough. It was actually sort of weird, <laughs> but it was also sort of gorgeous. So that was neat and fun. And I hung out with an author friend, um, Kim Fay. We were uh, both nominated for the Edgar and for 2012, and we're still really good friends. And she was so kind to drive me around. So we visited all these places. Like this is where the Brown Derby was, and this is where the Ambassador Hotel and the Coconut Grove. And then we wrapped up at, with a martini at uh, Musso's oh. because that's one of the few things that's still around uh, Musso and Frank's Grill. So we had right. a blast. It was really, oh. really fun. That sounds awesome. Was there anything that you weren't able to get to see that you're like, ah, you know, or you got everything in? Well, uh, I believe Susan. So it looks like Susan has froze. Oh, uh, well, you know what? It's, it's, it's funny because, well, you know what? I'm just going to keep talking. All right. So okay. <laughs> a lot of times buildings aren't there because they've been bombed. I'm just keeping going. Right. Um, but in California, they've just been torn down. And so the Garden of Allah Hotel is a real, it was a real place. It was across the street from the Chateau Marmont. And mm -hmm. it was allegedly the inspiration for the song, they paved paradise and put up a parking lot. Oh, really? They, did, they, they pulled it down and they put up, you know, some stores and stuff. So... You know, it's like you go to where the places were just so you're aware of where they are on the map and then it kind of gets in your imagination, but you can't actually go. Like the Ambassador Hotel is mostly torn down and like what remains has been turned into a high school. So oh, I, I know where it is and I, you know, I, I knew how right. they would drive there, but we couldn't right. go. Right, right. 
It's been, with the Garden of Allah, one of the things that I particularly enjoyed about the book was the way that you wove in um, the stories of gay women in Hollywood, which yes. is, you know, so often that sort of a salacious, like, ooh, so-and-so is sleeping with so-and-so. And you just give it in this wonderful way that highlighted, you know, how many contributions they made, you know, to, to culture, to film, to the war effort. Um, what, like, what made you decide like, hey, I really want this to be part of the this story. You know, again, that was one of those wonderful research rabbit holes. And Mariah, I know you, uh -huh. you get these too. And when, when you get that yes. kind of a break, it's like amazing. But I was thinking about where um, Gloria would have stayed um, in Los Angeles. She's going through a divorce. And the Garden of Allah was really like, it was a very good place for lots of people like divorcees, people in show business, writers, musicians, artists, people in the LGBTQ community. Um, and so when I started doing research and just the incredible um, history of the Garden of Allah Hotel in the LGBTQ community, um, I was just so taken by that and I thought it was so cool and it was just such a great part of Hollywood history that a lot of people don't know about. And I kind of mm -hmm. ran with that. Mm -hmm. And you were, you were talking about the sewing circle earlier. Yeah. So the, the hotel was founded and owned for a long time by a woman, uh, an actress named Ala Nazimova and she was bisexual and she had these, what she would term sewing circles, but they were <laughs> groups of like artists who were all LGBTQ. And because the Garden of Allah had its own security detail, um, the police were never involved. No, so that, that was really important because you know you could be arrested and like really bad things could happen. So right. the security detail made sure that no one would be harassed for anything regarding their sexuality. And um, I don't know, I just found it so fascinating. And I thought mm -hmm. it was actually also just so perfectly in character for this woman, Gloria, um, for, for many reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are a lot of, there were so many people in the book where I'm like, oh, he's a spy, he's a spy, oh, he's not, you know, there are a lot of like double lives going on here. And I actually, speaking of Gloria, I wanted to ask you how you came up with the mode, like, I was really impressed with the forensics of how ah. you determine her murder and, you know, Maggie goes to Caltech, which is so fun. Um, that, I, I really admire writers who do that well, and I thought you really did it well. Did you, was that easy or? Um, Again, I have to do a famous. shout out here to the amazing Val McDermott, who's not only a wonderful novelist in the crime genre, but who wrote an amazing book called Forensics um, hmm. about the history of forensics. Um, and I was able to go to a museum exhibit about it in London and also bought the book and read it a couple of times. And um, everything I know is thanks to Val McDermott. So, okay. Yay. I am buying that book. <laughs> yeah, I know it's so good. And it's really so interesting to see how far the field has really come, you know? Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, because I write about the Gilded Age where you basically don't have to deal with forensics because nobody right. knew anything. So, um, so by the end of the book, I felt like Maggie had reached a turning point that I actually did not see coming for her. I felt, all of a sudden I was very aware that she is not Mr. Churchill's secretary anymore. She is not following anybody down the hallway with a notebook. Um, did I read that right? And how would you describe what her arc has been? Well, in this book, we really see Maggie, um, you know, come through the darkness of the past few books and really come into her own. And she is not only standing on her own two feet, but she's ready to be a leader. And she has enough experience now and enough sort of cards to play that she can she can do that now. So she's she it's a hard won uh, victory for her. And I love there's a particular scene at the end. And I think that's what you're talking about. I loved yeah. writing that. It was so good. Yeah. 
I mean, can tell. Like, it was so good, but it was like so freeing. It to was. Finally write that for her. Yeah. No, all of a sudden, like I, I thought like, oh, okay, it's going to be, you know, the, the emotional resolution is going to be focused on John. And I do want to talk about that in a moment, but it was wonderful to have this scene where I was like, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. We're, we're, we're going in that direction because it's, it's interesting when you start a series where the whole concept is that the person is in a slightly subservient position. You know, they're a powerless person in the halls of power, but you want to move them forward. You don't want to keep them always in that place. And I thought you, you've done that so organically and well. Um, and it's, it's really exciting. 10 books. 10 books. <laughs> it, it's hard earned over 10 books. <laughs> It was. So, so do you want to say anything about Maggie and John, or are we just going to let readers come I think to that if they well? were on Facebook, it would be, it's complicated. <laughs> so, That's a good way of putting it. But there is, there is hope, and there will be more of John in future novels. He'll be going back to Europe with Maggie and Sarah. So um, it's a character that you know, was so big in the first few novels and um, he is now back. So, yeah. Yep. I'm, I'm excited I, about that. I love John. I mean, he's problematic in certain ways, but I really think he's kind of awesome. And I, I think Maggie often just misunderstands him. I think he means better. And I think yes. he's just slightly awkward sometimes. Yes. Yes. And she, she's <laughs> a little quick to, yeah. to say, wait a minute. So and she's quick to pass judgment like oh you you you're annoying me or you piss like this this annoys me and stop and now i'm mad at you but you know really he's trying he really has a good heart and he's trying his best so i'm i'm excited to have john to work with again he bought her a very nice dress this is a beautiful dress. <laughs> isn't that <laughs> every woman's dream <laughs> I don't every woman's you. dream to get like and it's it, it perfectly like that would never happen in real life right like i don't know i went with it, imagine it. <laughs> um, yes he bought her the yeah. green dress that's on the cover so yes and that is the yes, was... birthday movie theater where there's a disney movie premiere so that's referred to in the book too yeah it's like points to the design department they got the color of the dress exactly right absolutely so at the end of the book, you do set up the adventure of the next book, which I'm not going to reveal, uh, except that it does bring back a character, I think, who I found very intriguing from previous books. Um, we can say I'm bringing back um, Coco Chanel for yeah. the next Maggie book. And um, one of the reasons I really wanted to is because so much has been uncovered about Coco Chanel's work as a Nazi spy and her work um, to try to broker a separate peace with England with Churchill because she had this relationship with Churchill because they stayed at the country house of her lover. And so she had this in with Churchill. And I, I just really, really, really wanted to write about that. And Maggie mm -hmm. had such an interesting relationship with yes. Coco Chanel. So it, <laughs> it just seemed like it could be really, really fun and juicy and um, a way to sort of talk a little bit about parts of Chanel that people don't know about. Yeah, no, I remember reading that in your book for the first time and I was like, what? what? So yeah, no, I'm, I'm really looking forward. Um, do you know, like does the setting and the hook for the next book come to you as you're writing the current one or you have like a 10 year plan and you know exactly where you're going? I, you know, I do have a bit of a plan. Um, especially going towards an end point, I think. Um, so we're on book 10 and it's 1943. So I think it might take maybe six more books to get to okay. the end of the war. And I think it should end there. I don't think Maggie's a Cold War spy. I think she she's going to be a World War II spy. And when she's done doing her bit, she's going to go back to civilian life. Um, so I haven't vaguely planned out okay 
But um, I always get like more ideas when I'm, of course, I don't know what this happens with you, but like I'm writing the current book, but I'm always thinking about the one ahead of that. It's like more fun because I don't know, you don't have to like, oh yeah. Like, you know, so it's oh, a lot yeah. of fun to think about that book, the book you're not yeah. writing. Yeah. yeah you can so dwell like, I have tons fun. of thoughts about Maggie and Chanel, like, because I'm not writing it. <laughs> you're not because, oh, nice right. segue. <laughs> um, we're going to leave Maggie and Chanel for a little while because you are working on a standalone now. I'm working what? on my first standalone. First? And wow. I was basically so um, taken with everything I learned in the book, Hitler in LA. See, and I always complain I didn't get jewelry, but like I'm getting two novels, right? So this is good. <laughs> right. Um, go. But I thought it, it was so fascinating on so many levels. But I think what intrigued me most as a mystery thriller writer is that um, – so many people who were spies for this um, Jewish run spy organization died mm -hmm. in mysterious circumstances. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not made a huge deal in the, in the book. And I understand it's nonfiction. Nobody's going to speculate. There was never anything conclusive found. Nothing ever went to trial. Um, so it's just sort of like as a reader, I kept going through the book and being like, well, this guy died. And, you know, mm -hmm. fell and this guy died and choked and like all these people died. And then you sort of get to the end and a lot of these Nazis are brought up on trial for the sedition trial of 1944 and the judge dies before he gives a verdict huh. and the trial, it, it was declared a mistrial. Huh? And yep. there's just really nothing tying all this together in the book, which of course there is nothing tying it together because it's all speculation, right? It's just like a lot of deaths and nothing's ever been proven. But I think when you're a writer, you know, you look at those little points and you're like, there's a bigger story there. Like there's a really oh. big story there. So yeah. Oh, I really, sounds, really wanted to tell that. That sounds amazing. And is it going to be the same mix of like, fictional, but also nonfiction characters? Are you well, there are going to be um, nonfiction, like real life characters, but all based on the real people of the book. And I think it's mm -hmm. going to be a lot more, in, in a lot of ways, a lot more realistic. Like everybody's a lot more working class. Um, mm -hmm. Everyone is not connected with, you know, prime ministers or presidents or celebrities. It's like they're normal people who have done extraordinary things. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm focusing specifically on a woman and her daughter. Um, they were the only women in this spy organization. And this is absolutely true. Uh, they were a mother daughter team who pretended because they were uh, German American, they pretended to be Nazis and they went and worked in the organizations and they got all sorts of secret wow. plans and materials that they were able to pass along to thwart some really awful plans that, that were supposed to go down in Los Angeles. So these are much more, I mean, they're spectacularly amazing people, but they're much more like every day, like people we would know. Do you know what I uh -huh. mean? Yeah. Yeah. Is that a different writing approach? Like, have you found that slightly challenging or liberating um, or? You know, I kind of, like it's, I find it um, like working with a different color palette. I feel like with mm -hmm. Maggie, it's kind of like the colors of the covers. It's like really bright. And there's just like a lot of fluorescence and sparkles and gold and silver. And like, there's just a lot going on oh, and I yeah, feel like now yeah. right and I feel like I'm using earth tones and there's a lot more sort of grays and sepias and browns and um it feels very homey to me because these are the kind of people I grew up with and these are the kind of people mm -hmm. you know I know and it's it's actually just really nice like I'm really enjoying it I can tell when does it come out do you know well it's it's due in December. So okay. I think it's supposed to be coming out in February of 20. Wow. What year is it? So 2023. 
Okay. No. Uh, yeah. 22? 22 or February 22. 22. Okay. No, because that would be next year, right? No, so a year after that. I, I do need a little more time. Like, these are all new characters to me, and this mm -hmm. is a whole new book. And so I'm just taking a little bit more time. Um, so, yeah, but you can't hold me to that because, you know, things happen. Absolutely. Pandemics. And Pandemics happen. I was going, you know, you and I talked a lot this year about yeah. writing and focusing during a pandemic and the challenge, you know, stretched bandwidth and everything that was mm -hmm. happening this and year. And being wives and moms. Yeah. Yeah. In small mm -hmm. apartments. Yeah. <laughs> Did you, and I was thinking it really, it's sort of like the challenge, the regular challenges of balancing everything out with a writing career, but writ very large. Mm -hmm. um, did you, were there any like particular coping strategies you came up with? I, I just got very, very obsessive and sort of OCD about, I will do three pages today and I will rewrite one paragraph and like things like that. Um, um, you know, it was t like for many like, so people might not know this, but like I've, I live in Brooklyn where I lives in Queens, New York City apartments are you know, cozy. Um, <laughs> so being at home in the pandemic, especially with like our husbands and kids who were suddenly not at work and at school and trying to write was a little crazy. Um, but I started to just really because there was no choice. I just started to really embrace that and just sort of really like burrow into the book because I had, it was a way to escape what was going on in real life. Yes. Yeah. That was what I found. Um, the, but it was, you of course were writing a book that echoed everything that was going on. Yeah. Well, that was the life. problem. But yeah. you know, then when I was really down, you know, I'd, I'd save like a scene where they were going to go dancing at the, coconut grove or they would go yeah. see cab calloway and all these different like in the jazz club and wear beautiful things and go out and have cocktails with other people and th there was even a moment where i thought like oh my gosh they should all be wearing masks and that was like <sighs> but it was just so ingrained like it's just so yeah. ingrained like she oh you can't go out well right. of course she can't be a crowd <laughs> I actually wanted to ask you now. At the end of the book, it sounds like Sarah is coming to New York. She uh, she's going to be doing some cool uh, Broadway stuff in New York with um, George Balanchine, who also went from doing a lot of movie work in Los Angeles to uh, beginning his own company in New York. But I do think we'll see Sarah again. Well, I was going to ask: Does that mean that Maggie is coming to New York in a future book? Oh, I don't. I don't think you're not going to so. promise Although, that. No. Okay. You never know. You never know. You never know. You never know. Okay. It would be great. I mean, it'd be really fun. Although yeah. then I wouldn't get to take my trip because I live there. Right. So that's true. That is true. Um, I was thinking, we're gonna let, I don't want, I want everyone to get their questions in. So yeah. should we turn them over to John at this point? Yeah. There we go. Okay. So we've got a couple of questions there. And if you guys have more questions while we're chatting, please post those in the comments and we will get to them. But Mariah, before we get into questions, can you tell everybody a little bit about your Jane Prescott series? Yes. Oh, um, my Jane Prescott series is uh, about a lady's maid who works for a comically dysfunctional family in 1910s New York. And in the grand tradition, she is far smarter and more competent than they are. And in every one of the, the books progress from 1910, hopefully to 1918. And in every book, I try and take a signature event of the year in 1911, it's the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. And in Death of a Showman, it's 1914. Um, so of course, war is breaking out in Europe. Um, but uh, Jane's ex-boyfriend is putting on his first big musical. So um, they're not thinking so much about war over there. Um, these books are wonderful and so fun and so grounded in history. And I just, I can't say enough about Jane Prescott. I love oh, her. 
Oh, thank you. And so as we mentioned, so if anybody out there, if you want to start with the first one, the first one is A Death of No Importance. And as she, uh, she just mentioned, the newest one is Death of a Showman, which came out um, in April of this year. So Susan, I wanted to talk a little bit about the pacing of the series. So, you know, you were talking like the first one starts in 1940 and now we're 10 books in and it's only 1943. So that's a lot to, to get into three years. So how did you, how do you determine how they're going to be paced. Like Mariah just mentioned, she tries to focus around like, and kind of like moments in the war that are kind of helping guide you as you're pacing them. Yeah, definitely. And um, you know, the it, it's so interesting because everything in the war, we think of it as like one unit, you know, World War II, but you know, every three to four months, it's almost like a completely different war. Um, so, it sort of worked out to three books per year of the war. Yeah. Hmm. So, but I, that was just sort of natural. I don't know. I just, I, it gives them enough time between books to have a breather, but also mm -hmm. not such a long time that we kind of like lose the narrative. So. And it also, so you don't have to worry about the like long running series of like, oh, I started this series like 20 years ago and these characters, you know, are getting older and older and older. Like you don't have to worry about that. Not quite, I mean, they, they are getting older. You know, we yeah. might see Maggie um, think maybe a little bit about marriage and kids, maybe. But um, yeah, I mean, they're, yeah. They're, they're still, you know, it's only three three years that have passed really. And you you right. mentioned that you sort of have like kind of a story or you had a story arc for Maggie in mind. Did you know, like I was just looking, it's funny, like in uh, Mrs. Roosevelt's Confidant, you went to America and that was book five. And now five books later, you're back in America. And did you know that she was gonna come back to America? at some point? No, again, it's all because of that book. And I, I can't tell, I can't say enough about this book, Hitler in Los Angeles, um, Stephen R. Ross. And I read it and I was just like, I have to use this. I must use this book. And it, it, what was great was that I already had a character, John Sterling, who was, who was in Los Angeles. So it, it mm -hmm. seemed like there was a way to get her there organically or more organically. So I love I love hearing authors talk about kind of where their characters come from. You know, Jacqueline Winsphere has this great story about how she was just walking along one day and she just saw this woman coming up out of the subway in a cloche hat. And she was like, oh, this is Maisie Dobbs. And kind of everything came to her. Do either of you yeah. have like a story about kind of where your main characters like came from? Did they just appear to you? Like, how did they arrive in your in your life? Let's start with Susan. Oh, um, well, Again, I really have to thank the Muppets. Uh, and I know how crazy that sounds, but um, I was in London because my husband was doing work for Disney Channel UK. And I went to the war rooms and I, I wasn't thinking about writing a historical mystery or thriller or anything. I'd been doing writing, but mostly of the sort of sex in the city kind of thing, like single girl in New York, which I had had been. Um, and I was just completely knocked over by the war rooms and the atmosphere and the history. And I knew that I wanted to do something with it. So Maggie came from that visit, like the whole thing sort of came from that visit. And how Mariah, what about you? I, you know, it's funny, I had no intention of writing historical either. And I was working on a YA novel and like literally the first two lines of no importance, um, I will tell it and I will tell it badly came into my head. And I thought, well, that's not a 14 year old girl in New York. Um, and sort of slowly this image, I love, I love true crime. I love historical crime. And I'm sort of fascinated by what people who stand in a corner are able to observe. And the idea that a maid would know something about a crime of the century came, that was the story that started forming around this character. Um, and, uh, and she was just huge fun to write. I love her. 
But maids know everything, just like secretaries know right. everything. I mean, these are the people who actually run the world, If it, you know what I mean? So <laughs> right. I right. think it's a really great that these are the people who are going to solve your murders. Right. They're, 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 they're handling your dirty laundry. They know the secrets and, you know, they, they see, nobody sees them, but they see everything. So. So Susan, have you been tempted to go back to any of that, like the, the contemporary kind of rom com stuff that you had started with, or are you like done with that and you've moved on? Oh, you know, I, I feel like that's not really my, thing right now, although I was talking with um, Jeff Abbott and he has an amazing book called An Ambush of Widows um, out. Uh, it came out the same day as um, The Hollywood Spy. And Jeff and I were talking about research and basically he just sits down and writes. And I was, I had this moment of such jealousy. <laughs> <laughs> like, what if I said a murder in the present day? That would be, I could just sit down and start. Like I would have to do all this insane amount of research, so I was I was a little tempted. Yeah. But you wouldn't have all the support. Like I feel like history gives you so much. Yeah, absolutely. You know what? I, yeah, and then I have to learn about modern forensics, and there's so much that I don't know that he like he's educated himself about that I you know all of this crazy stuff that I don't have to deal with. So. Yeah. Right. And for any of you who are interested, uh, we did an event with Jeff last week with him and Hillary Davidson with Meg Gardner interviewing them. It was fantastic. So if you want to check that out, it's on the YouTube channel. So speaking of research, how do you how do you guys know when it's time to like you've gone far enough down the rabbit hole and it's time to like start writing versus when you need to keep kind of going further? So what's that point where you're like, OK, I have to put the research down and I have to start writing? How about you, Susan? You know, um, I could research forever. I love doing research and it's also a great way to procrastinate writing, mm -hmm. um, you know, but I've learned to do uh, less, like just less going in, but all, but research concurrently. So I'm writing like in the mornings and I'm doing research in the afternoons and evenings. So that seems to be working. So I, I'm not like, just an endless research rabbit hole, yeah. as right. fun as that is. What about you, Mariah? <laughs> yeah, I mean, when you're writing a series, you you have some grounding in where you are by book four and book 10. Um, but like with Death of a Showman, I was able to write like the first five pages. And then she mentions the family car, like <laughs> what a silver ghost. And I'm like, I have no idea like what makes a silver ghost the car it is. And I don't know anything about cars. So it was like, stop research massively about what that car looked like. Um, and then as you say, like there's sort of the, the prep research to convince yourself there is a story here. And you know, mm -hmm. what part of Broadway are you going to be talking about? Who are going to be your models for your characters and suspect risk and things like that. So, um, so yeah, no, I, I sort of do it concurrently as well. So, sorry, there seems to be a, a riot of children breaking out in the street outside. I'm going to just close the window. <laughs> okay, can I just say that I've been dealing, I, we're at a vacation house in Maine, and I've been dealing with a spider who's making a web on this dining room table where I've got my computer, so like... <laughs> Rioting children, spiders. <laughs> right, right. The writer's wow. wife. <laughs> Susan, you got the best present for your 10th book. You don't have it up there, do you? No, 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 no. But yeah, oh. I, 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 I was given a Lego typewriter, which <laughs> I loved. And it was given to me by some friends who are amazing and have been supportive through this whole thing. So 10 books later, yes, if you can write 10 books, maybe you'll get a Lego typewriter. Is it, what, how many pieces is that set? Like a bazillion. Oh, but God. as you know, I have a teenage son and he's like so excited about this. So <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, let's do it. Like. Right. You go, you start. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Call me when you get stuck. 
So as you guys are writing and you're working with like historical figures like Coco Chanel or Cab Calloway and people who have existed, how how do you go about being able to kind of write them or, you know, kind of put words into their mouth? Like how, how far do you, can you push kind of the, the fiction version of them with kind of still making sure it's historically accurate? Mariah, you take this one. Well, it's interesting. In Jane, I had my first actual historical person in showman. I'm not going to give it away because it's supposed to be a surprise because that person is not famous yet. But next, the next book I'm, I've just turned into my editor is actually the Lindbergh Nami, um, which is the story of the Lindbergh kidnapping from the point of view of the child's Nami, Betty Gow. So... Betty, Betty, you have in letters, so I had some sense of what her voice was like, but recreating Anne and Charles Lindbergh, who are, he in particular, incredibly complicated people that there are all sorts of competing stories, impressions about that, that was very difficult. Um, to figure out, to work back and forget what you know about him at a certain, starting at a certain point with like the war years, because this is pre-war years. Um, that was a lot of fun. It was a terrific challenge. I tried to stay as close to reports of things he had actually done and said. Um, so I was on firm ground with that. Yeah, I think just researching the heck out of things and. Oh, I think we. Froze. Yeah, I think Susan has frozen. Okay, so we'll give it a second and see if she comes back. Um... And going back to primary source material. Um... Oh, you hear me? Yep. Now we can. Now we can. Yeah, you just the lag caught up. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, and you know what? If 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 a character is going to be like just too like too sort of controversial, I'll just change the name at that point. You know, like <laughs> we'll just make a fictionalized character. So. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And that doesn't break your heart that you can't like. I don't know. You can't play with them in that way. You feel like I'm just going to switch them over to fictional. There were some people in the um, the SOE, basically like the the spy offices of the UK, um, who, you know, really when you get into their stories, did some questionable stuff, and it's not known what their motivations were. And mm -hmm. it, I found it more freeing actually to create fictionalized characters and then like give them motivations that were mm -hmm. really strong for them. And also then I didn't have to worry about you know like well what if their relatives like read this and you know so it's like a completely different name everything's changed you know but the the sort of gist of you know the character is still there right right all right so before we head out this evening i would love to hear from both of you and you're not allowed to say each other's books that's always my disclaimer um what is something that you have read lately that you love let's start with mariah um, well, I think like the rest of the world, um, I loved the plot that, I mean, just in terms of like desperate writer stories, that was very fun. But, uh, I'm also, I'm reading now Sajama Massey's The Bombay Prince and, you know, she is amazing. And this book is just as amazing as the first two. And, um, so yeah, that, that's, I'm really loving that one. Awesome. Um, I'm l loving uh, Jeff a uh, Abbott's An Ambush of Widows, and I love Hilary Davidson's new novel. And of course, I'm blanking on it because I lost my marbles because of COVID. But <laughs> you you know, John, you, I, your store carries I, it. What? I, I do. I knew it until you said that. It is. Um, I'm pulling it up right now. Her Last Breath. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so An Ambush of Widows. Her Last Breath, Jeff Abbott, Hillary Davidson, both fantastic reads, like so yummy and, and twisty and <laughs> perfect for summer. Awesome. 
And so if you guys are watching, if you want to check out any of the books that they mentioned, I just posted links to them in the comments so you can check all of them out. And um, we were lucky, I think Monday, we chatted with Aline Cogdill. Uh, she chatted with Sujata Massey about the Bombay Prince, which was also a big oh. favorite of ours as well. So that's also up on the YouTube channel, as I said. And so was the Hillary Davidson, Jeff Abbott, and Meg Gardner event, which was uh, super fun too. Um, so I think that is going to do it for us this evening. So for anybody who might have tuned in with us late, we've been chatting with Susan Alia McNeil, whose new book, The Hollywood Spy, has just come out. We have signed copies of it in store. And we've been chatting with Mariah Fredericks, whose newest book, uh, Death of a Showman, is out now. And we also have copies of it in the store. As we mentioned, we are open for browsing. So I hope you guys will come see us. If you have not started either series, we have the first in both series two and are happy to put them in hands. Mariah, thank you again so much for, for, for stepping up and doing this with us this evening. We really appreciate it. Thank you, oh. Mariah. Thank oh, you. Yeah, you're kidding. Thank it you, was John. Really thank you. Thank you, Susan. It was it was so good to see you. I'm sorry that we are not heading over to Good Company to get barbecue right now. I know. That's <laughs> killing me right now. <laughs> killing me. But next time. The last when definitely. We did, when we did the virtual event with Deanna Rayburn, because we always like Deanna Rayburn's like we're we're not going anywhere but good company for dinner. The last time I did the event with her, it's like, you know, I'm really tempted to just like uber eat some barbecue and she's like if you have barbecue after this virtual event i will kill you and i was like i'm sure you will we are not doing it i promise <laughs> if you have if you get uber barbecue i would not blame you if i were in texas i'd do the same thing yeah. it's we, that good yeah <laughs> you guys both have a great night thank you so much and we will hopefully when we do this again we will we will doing it in the bookstore Yay. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Murder by the Books. Thank you, John. Thank you, Thank you Mariah. Bye. Okay. Bye.